Hello, and welcome to the Core Philosophy Podcast. This is episode 161, Where Has All the Polyphony Gone? with David Simmons Wood. Recently, David made a splash by writing an article for Early Music America called Toward a Rebirth of Renaissance Choral Repertoire. The article is linked in the show notes, but he made the observation recently that out of about 215 pieces heard during the four-day ACDA National Convention, only two were from the Renaissance. Now, this is not some type of a extensive study to justify a statement about a trend in choral music, but if you expand your vision beyond the ACDA National Convention, you can see that there really is a trend away from Renaissance polyphony and polyphony in general. David is drawing attention to what I see as a troubling gap in our collective repertoire and programming trends, namely the near disappearance of polyphony from our performances, classrooms, and in the textures of new music explored by living composers. Polyphonic writing provides so many building blocks for the rhetorical and theoretical mind of the musician, but also crucial steps in the development for young singers. So what is driving this atrophy of access to a foundational piece of our art form? It is a complicated problem. So tune in as David and I discuss issues related to classroom challenges, the intimidating expert, the lack of exposure, and even the unintended casualty of our attempts to focus on diversifying repertoire and the push to include more living composers. We also go deep into the solutions, ways to get started, resources and benefits of polyphony in school and community ensemble settings. Stick around for that. Now, I do have to apologize in advance. When you get to the interview portion, you are going to notice the audio quality change a little bit. And so apologies to you and to David, who drove all the way to my house from Manhattan, Kansas to do this uh, interview. And then I screwed up the setup of one of the microphones. So I had to use a backup source of audio. It's boosted and cleaned up pretty well. You're going to have no trouble hearing or understanding. It just doesn't have that Coralosophy crystal clearness. So stick around. It will be worth it. Enjoy. I'm excited to tell you about Ludus.com, a new platform designed for the performing arts by people from the arts. With Ludus, you'll have access to a friendly, knowledgeable customer success team that's available when you need them. And the best part? There are no setup costs, contracts, or hidden fees. It's 100% free to your program, so why not give it a try and see how Ludus can help you streamline your operations and put the focus back on your passion for the arts. Coralosophy listeners can go to ludus.com forward slash Coralosophy for an upgrade for free to their marketing suite. Patreon page is what really literally keeps this light on that is shining in front of me to make sure that I can continue to do, do the show forever. So head on over there. There are, of course, various levels that you can join. And at the producer or above level, we have Brian Long, Chandler Smith, Venture Studios, John Warner, Jonah Clixbull, Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcon, Angie Schilling, Carlos, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Jared Hendricks, Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Herron, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kikachik. Head to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and join the crowd. All right. Well, David Simmons Wood, welcome to the Coralosophy podcast. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, David is uh, here to talk about something that I love also, which is early music, Renaissance polyphony, uh, all, of, all of the things that are um, related to that in choral music. So David, welcome. Yeah, well, thanks for asking me to be here. Lovely to uh, be a part of the podcast uh, and uh, yeah, talk about these issues. So. And also thanks for making a trip all the way here in person. I yeah. always in, uh, think these are so much more interesting mm-hmm. conversations, not only to have, but to listen to later. So I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, let's start by having you just uh, tell everybody who you are mm-hmm. and what you do. So, yeah. And maybe even if you kind of transitioned from that into your connection to this topic. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I teach at Kent State University. Uh, I direct the early music ensembles there. Um, I also teach courses in theory and history and performance practice, um, and I also am the programs director at Early Music America, which is the um, uh, north and now beginning to be South American service organization for early music and historical performance practice, um, and I've been doing that for about eight years, and I've been at K-State for nine um, my background is in uh, voice, and I have a degree in choral conducting, um, and spent some time uh, doing church choirs and such, uh, and doing some gigging, and worked for about eight years in public radio as a music director at a radio station. 
um, uh, while I was performing and doing the other stuff I just mentioned. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's, so I kind of uh, specialize in performance practice and style and coaching style uh, and those types of things, which I think fit in really kind of yeah. hand in hand. So. Now, how did you, um, as young David, mm -hmm. what was your kind of entry into early music and Renaissance music? Yep. Or even, I don't even know how you define early music. Some sure. people, let's start there, actually. Yes. When, when you say the term early music, what <laughs> do you mean? Yeah, that's really complicated. And we, you know, we come across that with early music America, too. So there are some people, of course, who will say it's anything before the Baroque. Okay. There are some people who say it includes up to the Baroque. The term now, I think, is is there were kind of we use that term and the idea of the field of historical performance practice kind of interchangeably, which means right. that sometimes when people say early music, they may mean the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, so I, with my ensembles, those early music ensembles, I try to focus mostly on what has historically been kind of the early music field. So medieval, renaissance, some Baroque mm -hmm. stuff. We do things outside of it. I've done 19th century Kansas immigration songs and, and mm -hmm. uh, like ab abolitionist music and stuff as well. But I try to kind of concentrate um, there. I have a great interest in um, 16th century, early 17th century, uh, and also 15th century music. Um, and so when I when I talk about it, it, <laughs> it depends on who I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I also think that I agree that I follow, I fall into the, when I say it, I kind of more broadly mean the historical performance field in which we are trying to take what we understand from the writings of the time and the instruments that have remained as we try to piece together possibilities for what it was way music might have sounded mm -hmm. at the time mm -hmm. um avoiding that that uh that dreadful term of authentic as much as possible and using that historically informed yeah um, right so that's that's kind of uh where i am but i like to focus with the ensembles that i work with um in that sort of 14th 15th or sorry uh 15th 16th and uh early 17th century okay yeah. and what was your first love what got you into that what pulled you into that so i kind of got to early music in a roundabout way both my parents had music education degrees my mom did work as a um as uh, a elementary school music teacher for a while um she also directed the youth choir that i was in um and so we had music around and i was a horn player and elementary school and middle school and stuff um and we'd always been singing but i i my first real interest with music that I really dug into was actually traditional Irish music. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that really is what got me to early music mm -hmm. because when you're looking at traditional Irish music, and by that I really mean um, not necessarily sort of pub music, which is its own thing, and it's great, just as, just as great, but as, you know, traditional, what we call like shamnos, which is the old style singing in the Irish language, and um, things that have sort of been around for a while. Mm -hmm. So in essence, those thoughts about performance practice have kind of been there, even though I wasn't thinking, how were they doing it in the 19th century, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, it was me adapting to a different performance practice style by being around the, the Kansas City uh, Irish music scene yeah. um, as uh, as a younger person and, and was greatly influenced by a group that was uh, located in Western Missouri called Scardiglin um, with some wonderful uh, uh, musicians, some who are still in the Kansas City area and some who are um, elsewhere now. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that. Um, I also lived in Germany for a while as a kid um, and we lived in uh, a, uh, a, a, a next or part of a town that was really an untouched medieval town. Okay. So that idea of history and being inside of places where history was really brought to life because here are these castles and things like that um, has always been a part of that. So we had a few experiences when I was in high school choir, when I was finally in choir in high school, um, where we, um, you know, we sang a little Palestrina because we were preparing for all state choir mm -hmm, that year, mm -hmm. um, and we had another uh, John Bennett piece, uh, and those were my first real 
tastes of Renaissance music. And I loved them. Uh, I, I absolutely loved performing that music. Um, and because it was just enough difference, but I also, I really liked the kind of musicality that, that yeah. comes from having these independently written uh, parts. So yeah. that was kind of my foray into it. And then when I went to Kansas State for my undergrad, um, I was involved in the Collegium that I now direct um, and uh, had some great experiences performing there. Um, and then I went to University of North Texas and was uh, um, a graduate assistant for within the early music program there yeah. with our Collegium singers, working with Lyle Nordstrom, also with uh, Lorena McCroskey. Um, and got to see some, got to have uh, experiences with some bigger things, like performing uh, Bieber masses with full Baroque orchestra, uh -huh. Venetian polychoral music, and all this type of stuff. And so that, it kind of exploded out from there. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Indiana University to the Early Music Institute and really committed, I think, yeah. at that point. So Yeah. Yeah, yeah for me, um, <clears throat> my first experience with polyphony specifically that really just blew my mind and kind of sold me on it was probably not until grad school. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had done some madrigals in high school choir and they were fine and nothing, like nothing had really sparked my imagination mm -hmm. until I found myself in a kind of semi-pro, small ensemble, two on a part, mm -hmm. um, taking the music into the acoustic that's appropriate for what the composer would have intended. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is a topic of a different podcast, but not cutting loose like it's an opera chorus yeah, sure. um, and actually trying to shape lines and refine mm -hmm. within the ensemble. I'd never done that before, never mm -hmm. been asked to do that before. Um, and I just remember some of those first rehearsals um, among, you know, excellent singers that had been working in this style. I was the new kid, so to speak, mm -hmm. but my mind just exploded mm -hmm. to, to a sound that I just never had knew, known was possible because mm -hmm. that texture and uh, that texture just doesn't exist in modern choral music. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe that's actually um, a, a good, the best place to jump into the article you wrote. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier um, where you're you're wearing one of the hats you wear is with the Early Music America mm -hmm. organization, and mm -hmm. and so not too long ago you wrote an article uh, and through their blog, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. um, and it was called um, Canto, which uh, you can tell us about that and what mm -hmm. that means. Uh, mm -hmm. toward a rebirth of Renaissance choral music. So mm -hmm. why don't you share with us kind of the cliff's notes of what you wrote about in this article and what you were hoping to bring light to. Sure. So um, so just to frame it a little bit, so Canto is a recurring uh, column that happens in our magazine throughout the year. And uh, Early Music America has a magazine called EMAG uh, that comes out three times a year, um, in addition to all of our online uh, reviews and all the other things that we do, um, scholarships and webinars and all the other stuff that EMA does. Um, uh, so they had, it's a, there's a rotating group of authors, um, and there are different people. And so our uh, publications director, um, Pierre Rue, who is uh, a joy to work with, uh, asked if I would consider writing something because he and I had sort of been talking about some of these issues. I've been telling him about some of the things that I've been thinking about. Um, and so the article really, it, it, it comes, it came from a fact that as over, over many years and mostly, during my time at K-State as I've sort of looked at concerts that either are from our students or at conventions that I've gone to or local concerts or whatever, I just see a, this, this what I think of as kind of a hole in the repertoire, which is this Renaissance music mm -hmm. hole, mm -hmm. that it's just not as prevalent. And so I um, had uh, been, uh, I had remembered from a, a few years ago, there was a regional uh, ACDA conference, and I'm going to forget which which conference it was in or which uh, region it was in. But I remember reading um, about a teacher who took her students and had all of her students keep track of all the pieces that were performed, and then let's see what um, let's see what errors they were from. And she was just doing it from a an educational standpoint. Like, let's break it down and just see there. Um, but it struck me because in that conference, in that regional conference, it it really came that, you know, Renaissance was the least performed of anything. And actually, for the most part, even in that conference, it was um, mostly uh, contemporary music or or 20th century music and a little bit, and then it dribbles off um, all the way through the Renaissance. And, uh, and 
so that was on my brain. So I thought, oh, I'll take a look at this year's ACDA National National Convention. And, you know, there were over 200 pieces performed. Um, and that doesn't include, if, I mean, I didn't break down if it was there were a few large works that were performed. And clearly it's by the same composer. So, um, but of the 216 sort of different works that were performed, only two uh, were from the Renaissance. Uh -huh. um, and it just struck me as being the same as what I've been seeing. It wasn't that it was, an, it was you know, an anomaly from what I had seen. Uh, I think in an article I mentioned, I think there's like 186 basically were contemporary, and then the rest were um, by non-living composers, uh, and then we get to this. And so, um, so I took that as a jumping off point of not to say, hey, we're bad people because we're not performing Renaissance music and to chide people, but to say, what, what's what's going on? Let's take a look and mm -hmm. let's see why it why it is that this massive amount of repertoire that we have in the Renaissance period, and honestly, if we even think about 17th century, which could be lumped in there because there were no 17th century pieces uh, in there as well, we have this great wealth of choral music um, that's just not being uh, not being performed yeah. um, largely. And, um, and coincidentally, the article, I'm going to forget the, the author, um, but the article that came out in Choral Journal in, I want to say it was in April, that took a look at all state choirs and broke down all state yep. choirs um, over many years. Um, and uh, it was very coincidental that those two things happened at the same time. Uh, that was right as I had submitted mine. I picked up and saw this other article. And it was a similar thing. I think in that giant list of the most performed pieces, I think there are three or four that are Renaissance pieces. And there are complicating factors to all state choirs, clearly. Um, so I just thought, what are some things? So in the in the article, I give some suggestions, or I, I give some reasons by for why I think that the music is not being performed. Mm -hmm. Some of the some of the reasons why it it's it may be difficult in terms of fitting in with pedagogy and and the other types of things that are already going on in the choral classroom. And I'm really thinking about high schools and, and, and colleges uh -huh. at, at this point. Um, and then I tried to give some sort of, here are some ways that we could think about going. As you're thinking about a future school year or getting ready for a school year to start, it's important that you have your Sight Reading Factory memberships ready to go for you and all of your students, your classrooms set up with your rosters imported so that you can really get the most out of that membership. And of course, you get 10% more out of that membership whenever you enter Coralosophy at checkout to renew or subscribe, and you'll get a discount for your program. Forward. And so that's that's um, how, I, how I broke it down. What are some examples of, of things that you thought of as reasons why this might be happening? So I think, um, and the first thing I put down there, and I um, that I think it is, and I think this is, it's a great thing that we need to keep in mind, and then also work on other things. Is that there's been such a wonderful push to to um, raise up the voice of living composers yeah. recently, yep. um, uh, you know, and I think that's great, uh, and I think it's important that we support um, you know living composers now. And I think that um, if you look at that, the way I broke things down or the way that, you know, the, the all state choir things fall out or anything else, you're seeing that the vast majority of, of programming is from is living composers um, or composers, you know, who are recently dead composers, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I will point out that. You know, an entire program, if we're thinking about um, trying to fit a mission of, of, of a, an expansive choral pedagogy, that maybe there's room for more than just living, living composers. Um, and there are other ways to think about that. And I, I think that one of the reasons, I, I think there are lots of reasons as to why those, the living, working with living composers also makes a lot of sense in a classroom. Um, people are trying to tell, uh, to, to create programs that tell stories about what is happening in our world and mm -hmm. to help their students, you know, think about those in their audiences. Um, and obviously people who are living now can talk about now in a way that people 300 years ago couldn't talk about now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's, it's, um, it's 
I don't want to say easy. It, it makes sense to say, I want to program on this kind of very contemporary you know, theme, and so I'm going to look for composers who have written about that theme, or I'm going to commission somebody to write about that, uh, and I'm going to put those in, in, into a concert. Also, at the, same, at the same time, those people are, by and large, with you know, little, little differences, are writing in a, in a modern choral style. Yeah. So the, the the choirs who are performing that music, it's most of the time it's not a new sonic experience for them. They're used to it, so it means it's faster to, to learn it because they're not learning a new performance practice. Um, they it's probably in their language um, uh, because a lot of the, the music, especially American groups, that are being performed uh, composed by by new composers are pieces that are in English but because they're telling those stories. Um, with exceptions, clearly. Uh, and so I think it, it's sort of like, it, it makes a lot of sense and would not be that different if you were to go to the Renaissance period, right? People were, perf- were composing at that time and that was the style and that's what people performed largely. Uh, there's a, a writer who says, you know, it, it's, it's going to concerts was more like going to the movies. When you go to the movies, you don't want to see the same movies every single time you go. You want to see the new movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think we have that some. So I think that's that's a big reason. Uh, And there's really good things about that. Um, I just think that as we're trying to create, um, uh, you know, versatile musicians, well-rounded, you know, educated musicians, giving them exposure to more than just what's current is is as an aspect within that. So that's that was kind of the first one. I mean, I think you know the idea of teaching uh, what people are kind of used to and and what they're uh, what they're seeing. Mm-hmm. So when you go to conferences, is if what you mostly see is new composers, then when you go back home to program for your choirs, you're probably going to be thinking about those pieces. Oh man, that was a really cool piece. That would work great with my group. The, all the reading sessions are all new music, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, you know because we're publishers and composers are getting their stuff out there. And that's, you know, that's, that's great. Entrepreneurship is really important. Um, but when we have that as the, the dominant thing that's happening at conventions and, and other things, then we're kind of saturating ourselves in our, our ways of thinking about programming with that kind right. of music. And so if we have more options out there, then people can think about those in their own programming. And so the other thing I, I brought up is I just think there's a there's a, a lack of familiarity with earlier pieces. Um, the pieces that come up tend to, by and large, kind of be the same pieces mm-hmm. um, that have kind of ended up being the staples, the Palestrina, Secret Cervus, the Talus, If You Love Me, the Weep O Mine Eyes by John Bennett, um, the... Um, Victoria Oman Mysterium. Those are the things, and those are beautiful pieces. But when we start, when we start, oh, I'm going to do a, a holiday concert. I'll just do the Victoria because that's the one piece yeah. that I know. So we're not exposing not only current teachers and choral directors, but then the students who then will become either the choral singers or those directors in the future. Mm-hmm. So how can we get that? So I think those are kind of two two major issues. Um, um, one of them, I think, is something that needs to be improved on uh, in terms of access and exposure. And the other one is not something I think needs to be improved on, I think is already great, is the idea of living composers. Right. So how do we put them together? That's Yeah, that's really good. That's a good summary. And I, so I'd like, what I'd like to do is mm-hmm. throw some of my thoughts in mm-hmm. to that and I want you to see what you think. Yeah. So... Because I agree with the, that dichotomy you just set up, which is that there are some practical aspects um, that are challenges. I, can, I would put in the category, as somebody teaches in the high school classroom, challenges that need to be overcome in the educational setting because it's worth it. So, for example, um, Renaissance polyphony, um, I, in my opinion, is a responsibility for vocal music educators to be teaching, partly because it's foundational to all of the music that we are doing now. So one of the most common misconceptions and the, um, I, I guess, misexplanations that I hear um, is that, uh, for example, modern Western classical music theory was invented in, by you know people in colonial Europe. Mm-hmm. No, it was discovered little bits at a time 
right. over many centuries and then codified and written down mm -hmm. um, based on uh, and the, the, the polyphonic music evolution, mm -hmm. for if you go all the way back to when music was one part, mm -hmm. and then they thought they'd get really saucy and put in a second part, right. they're discovering these things mm -hmm. it, um, at, in the same way that in scientific realms we've discovered different combinations of elements and put them together and, and then told. So the idea that you know science wasn't a, a thing you just that was once discovered in the same way music theory wasn't a thing that was discovered mm -hmm. or invented. Yes. Right. right. Um, and so um, so if we don't teach polyphony through the ages, mm -hmm. then we then we're teaching a very incomplete con uh, theoretical concept yeah. right. to students. Mm -hmm. So that's one part of it. The other part of it to kind of uh, to go to the other aspect of yours, which is this living composer thing. I think it's more complex than just li living composers versus dead composers. Mm -hmm. I think it's also um, I see this problem as kind of an unintended consequence of the effort to diversify repertoire. Mm. Uh, Renaissance polyphony is an unintended casualty sure. of, of yeah. that. Because, and, just, and it's just math. Mm -hmm. So if I mm -hmm. think about like, um, I've got six pieces on my ACDA program, yeah. and I've got to have uh, two of them that are by, um, you know, by a man who's not white mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And, but then, like ninety percent of the repertoire, if you're just going to look based on titles going back a thousand years, are from a time where <laughs> you're not going to find females who are not white writing music, right? In, in the way that we, that, mm -hmm. uh, in in sheer numbers, right? Right. Um, and so, it, in an effort to uh, balance the scales in the current, in the present, mm -hmm. we have to put our thumb on the scale mm -hmm. of the past. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and I don't think, when I say unintentional. I don't think someone said, you know what, I'd really like to wipe out Renaissance polyphony from the choral. Right. Right? Yeah. Right. But then that's an, that ends up being the easy, low-hanging fruit to get rid of because of all those challenges that you just said. Yes. You know what I mean? All right. Mm -hmm. re re thoughts on my uh, theory. I, I agree. I agree. So I and I think I think um, I agree in the fact that we're we're trying to we're trying to share as many perspectives as possible. And mm -hmm. I do think you're right that it's an unintended casualty um, of that. And I think that um, one of the things that the way I try to approach that when I have the opportunity of working um, with ensembles where I'm doing more than just early music, and I try to include early music within that, is that I, I try to think about how, how over time people have struggled with many of the same issues that we have mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And so we're still repre we're representing a, a diversity of, of viewpoints through the window of time. So we've got how, you know, how did someone who was struggling through the 30 years war experience life and death and, you know, and all those things. And yes, through all the other lenses of, you know, what, you know, ethnicity they were, what religion they were, or those types of things. And so I think that, um, I think that there are ways of, of making those considerations to include those voices through time within what we're doing, what, when they're doing now. Um, thankfully, there's lots and lots of good research that's going in and we're discovering regularly um, new voices that we didn't know about, new voices that we're writing a long time ago. Right, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, um, there are... There are we know now in the last, you know, couple of decades and have been able to elevate the voices of female composers from the Renaissance that when I was first learning about that, I didn't know anything about Absolutely. Aliotti and Casulana. And, um, you know, I knew about Hildegard von Bingen and the next woman that someone mentioned was probably Fanny Mendelssohn, yeah. you know, and it was, and that was it. And, you know, we didn't talk about um, Cassiani, um, who's way earlier, you know, in that and, you know, maybe the, the first uh, published female composers that we know about. Um, so there are many, many more options than there were. Mm -hmm. um, obviously the scale between between male and female composers is still heavily male from those right. older, from old, just because of the state of time. So I, I, I think that is a consideration um, that that conductors have to 
have to work with. And, mm-hmm. and I don't know that there's an answer. I just, I, I, I hear one of the things I heard as a result of the, of the article when there were a few things, but one of the things is someone said, well, you know, it's, it's, I can't do it because it's, you know, it's music, it's sacred music from the church. And, you know, in my program, we, you know, we specifically, we try to avoid sacred music. Well, my reaction is there's a bunch of non-sacred music. Right. There's a ton of secular music. Yeah. Um, just like there's a ton of music that's not hyper florid polyphony uh-huh. that, you know, there's, and I think the, because we have this lack of, of, knowledge of the depth of what's available within you know, let's just say that you know 200 ish years uh between you know 1400 and 1600 ish i'll just just to kind of narrow it down because we're not necessarily teaching the 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 variety that is available in there when we are looking for variety within our programs that doesn't occur because all of a sudden we think okay i've already ticked these two boxes and i'm trying to tick other boxes well i can't I'm, I'm, I'm already done with what I can possibly get from the mm-hmm. Renaissance because um, like, it, it can't be sacred. So I'm done with the Renaissance because it's only sacred music or I can't perform it because I'm not going to be in a big church. Well, there was plenty of music written for rooms like this, you yeah. know, like where people were just singing together and uh, not everybody was in a cathedral. So, um, so I think those considerations uh, can be mitigated by some more exposure. And if the educator has been convinced that it's important to try to mitigate those things. Yes. And to say, you know, there are many, there are many different ways in which we want to look at the human experience. And one of those ways, and and I'm not even saying, let's not, I don't think everybody has to, you know, don't put a Renaissance piece on every concert. If you don't want to put a Renaissance piece on every concert, that's not like my end goal. It's not Mm -hmm. to, you know, 50, 50 it, you know, or even do every concert. It's just to say, what are we doing to help expose our students to more of this and our audiences? And maybe that will then grow and people will understand that, but how can we, how can we do that? Um, but until we, until there is more exposure, people don't know what's available. Yeah. Um, and I, and it can be daunting because there are thousands and thousands of pieces. Um, and so where do you start? And so right. that's, that's, that's a hard thing. Um, and if it's not a regular part of the, the curriculum, um, you know, even with like the music history curriculum in the in the undergrad, um, you know, we we depending on what school you're in, it's a two or three semester thing, maybe maybe four semesters. Um, but and you're going to talk about Renaissance choral stuff when you're in there, but you're so I think so hyper fixated in those history courses about learning the facts and what evolved around that. There's no time being necessarily not as much time being spent on sort of exposure and appreciation and, and those types of yeah. issues um, within it, which is, you know, just a difficulty in the fact that we're trying to do it in a, in a small time. It's yeah. not a good answer, but maybe when we're looking at our core literature courses um, or, or other places, there's ways of getting people to understand this more. And for, for high school or even middle school, um, you know, I think little bits of it, little bits of exposure um, can make a big difference. Uh, I have a, a former student, uh, an alum of K-State, um, who teaches in Southern Kansas, and uh, in his middle school that he was at, um, he did a, a World Music Wednesday, where he kind of made a unit out of it at the beginning of class, and they really dug into a particular country and learned about the country and a particular form of music and this type of thing. Well, maybe you can incorporate a Flashback Friday or a Throwback Thursday, where we spend 10 minutes and we say, you know, to the students, here's a here's a Renaissance piece. Oh, let's try to figure. Is it a natural? Is it a motet? Is it something mm-hmm. else? What country is it from? What was going on in that country at that time? Who was this composer? What were they writing for? You know, those types of things. Where it's the goal is not necessarily at that point performing, but just to say, let's let's hear some music and let's mm-hmm. learn about those people. And it can be interdisciplinary at that point if you're thinking about right. it um, in that way. But I think. With without more work being done to expand the knowledge base for us, um, then we're not going to know when we go to do the programming or trying to tick off boxes what can fit in. There. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think people would be surprised too to to learn that audiences find it refreshingly almost new 
to yeah. hear music yeah. from that time, mm -hmm. because as we've been discussing, it's so rarely performed. Yeah. Um, you know, in the in the broader context, and I do want to go back to one thing you said a second mm -hmm. ago too, which is that um, that through early music um, and through kind of, well, I guess I would even say uh, just exploring the history of music mm -hmm. uh, with our students, with our choirs, with our audiences, etc. We're uh, tapping into something that, about the human experience. Yeah. And I think part of this conversation, it's also important to highlight the idea that the human experience can't be, um, uh, can't be categorized in a kind of a reductive way, mm -hmm. like I was talking about with the checkboxes of diversity of quotas and whatnot for conventions. Like you can't quantify it in black, white, brown, male, female, trans. Like those are very, those are all parts of the human experience, mm -hmm. but they're very reductive ways of thinking about them because within each of those categories, for example, uh, within each of like within the, within the category that we now call white, mm -hmm. there are many ethnicities. Sure. <laughs> Same thing with well, the, the category that we now now call black. Many ethnicities. In mm -hmm. fact, the continent of Africa has more genetic diversity within it. Than in the rest of the world combined, sure. right? So, and that, that I, I don't want to take the podcast mm -hmm. in a very nerdy direction like that, but that's something that I think about a lot when I'm thinking about how to communicate to students, for example, um, that the human experience uh, is as diverse as the people groups that we live in now. Mm -hmm. If you can't figure out how to, how, like that, Palestrina had something to say uh, yeah. that that maybe Tupac said too. Yeah. Then, right. then you're not looking hard enough. There's a, a wonderful um, video, it's a TEDx uh, video by a uh, Baroque flutist named Amy Ferguson, where she brings up that similar connection in that she looks at these Renaissance part songs and looks at the kind of, um, the, the what we might think of as extreme bodiness uh -huh. In the time and the things that that were being said that would make some people today blush, and she she reads it to a group of people and says, you know, when was this wrote, written? Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, you know, is it? It sounds like something that's contemporary, but it was actually written by a you know by a, a, a Renaissance composer who was writing for people. I have not seen this before. video. I need to yeah. go find that. Yeah, uh, that sounds like right up my alley. Okay. It's and and it's the idea that we have. We can't pigeonhole things. I had a I, I had an experience with a conductor one time who we were looking at a, a Baroque piece and he said, This is Baroque, so it's going to be stately. <laughs> Blanket statement. You right. know? And and I don't I don't believe that because I think people people are people. Um, and you know, for example, um, there is a piece that we think most likely was written by um, Marguerite of Austria, um, who was nobility, um, and was written kind of in the style of uh, of um, Pierre de la Rue, and it's a it's this um, little chanson four part, beautifully written polyphony. Um, we're pretty sure that she wrote it. We're almost definite that she wrote at least the words for it. Um, and it was an epitaph for her parrot, um, for her dead parrot. And it is stunningly beautiful. But it's a, someone who's writing it for their dead pet. I mean, yeah. what, that's super relatable. Right. I mean, that's. You know that's that's wonderful, and not, and also you know we've got we've got you know people who otherwise weren't you know voicing other things you know and took the time to write this this uh, you know this this beautiful work um, uh, to you know to talk about how they were sad with their parents. Did. Yeah. Oh. Or, yeah. You yeah. just okay. So you just threw out several yeah. examples <laughs> of something I, this is kind of what I was trying to get at. That's why I love conversation because it reminds me back and forth like what's going on here. So you brought up the example of body text from mm -hmm. uh, from you know hundreds of years ago mm -hmm. that if we were to read it now we might think okay this is contemporary. Why? Because people say those same types of things now. Uh, you brought up the example of um, female composers mm -hmm. that maybe you uh, you and I when we were gr growing up we didn't learn about these these people. Yeah. You know, all of, to me, those are both examples of when our, our view of history becomes so oversimplified that we think, oh, okay, so I'm going to write off, essentially, or I'm going to not prioritize music from this whole time period and from this whole place in the world, because the past is, you know, 
problematic or mm-hmm. whatever. It's more it's more racist or more sexist. Mm-hmm. Well, in reality, if you're if most people listen to this podcast are just audio only, so I'm doing like a graph with my hand. <laughs> um, but like in reality, those types of bad things kind of go like this. Sure. Like they 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 ebb and flow. So for example. Um, why would it be that there were a lot of female composers, or not a lot, but some, writing and being published at a time hundreds of years ago when we think of like, oh, well, back then only men did that. But that's our oversimplification of history. And and uh, and then we forget that there, the ideas that people held about gender roles back then are very different than what we think of it now. And we actually had to go through the, the kind of era of Protestant... Protestant um, um, Kind of reformation and the aftermath of like uh, uh, puritanism sure. and all of that yeah. and, and so in our view our 21st century view we look back on puritanism mm-hmm. as being like the, like this is history that's where all of our bad things came from right. and so then we think of well all of history must have been that way but then we forget that like you know certain times like 14 and 1500s italy for example yes there were problems that we would now look back on and think of as social problems but that's actually, in a lot of ways, there were some very egalitarian things happening in society at that time. You know, so I, I think I'm I'm, right. I'm rambling, but I think you get the idea. And, and so we look back and we think, oh, history equals bad, mm-hmm. um, because bad. That's when all the bad people lived. Today, we all the enlightened people <laughs> are <laughs> yeah. alive. <laughs> and, yeah, I think it's the one of the reasons why I have always been attracted to this idea of historically informed performance practice is because. I really love trying to put myself in another person's shoes. Mm-hmm. And ultimately that's what that's what they're doing. I mean, and as musicians, I think we we try to do that a lot. Um, and we're trying to see from a certain viewpoint, we're trying to adapt a style that may be unfamiliar to us, but I find that to, that is what's engaging to mm-hmm. me. Is, is to do that work and to find out, you know, the way that messages were told or, you know, and how is it different? And um, so what, what I try to do when I when I am working with the performance practice course or, you know, I'm just starting to work with a student who wants to really dig into style is I, I have to try to point out what are our modern day conventions that we take for granted because they're conventions. What are, what are the unwritten things that we do in music? that if someone in 200 years, 300 years, looked at our music with no context would never be able to do. I think a good example is like, you know, you you get the uh, four-part choral arrangement of a hit from a Disney movie, and all of the students in your class know that it doesn't sound right, or a pop song, you know, or something like that that's been done in a choral arrangement. They know it doesn't sound right because the performance practice isn't there. You know, the, the slides or the kind of finessing of syncopation in ways that is not available on the page because our we don't have nuance that way mm-hmm. yet. You know, we're still, like, music is still developing. And so I think when people can begin to, to identify their current the, the the things they don't think about that affect their musicianship or their perspective on the world or whatever we can go farther into you know the other ways this impacts our life but when they start to actually identify what are those what are those those things that i'm putting on the things already that i take for granted because i think they're normal but really they're just my current brain thinking that yeah you know and now when i do this music from a different time, I need to take myself, I need to, I need to separate myself as much as possible. We can never fully separate ourselves because we are 21st century people, but I need to say, okay, but here are the places where it's going to change. And it's sort of like a, um, it's like an inter- interchanging. Okay. I'm going to take this idea of eight note, major minor scale, you know, functional harmony tonality I'm just going to take that, I'm going to set that aside, and I'm going to think now about six-note hexachord scales. That's how all this stuff was being written. They weren't thinking about an eight-note scale in the the Renaissance time. They weren't thinking about chordal harmony, the way we're thinking. So I just have to change my my viewpoint. Um, And I think we learn a lot about the way people looked at things. Um, There's an interesting, and I don't know what kind of writing there is, um, but we have this change in... um, well, you asked earlier about what I think of as like early music. Oftentimes, uh, anymore, when I think about dividing sort of 
the performance practice, I have to think about a rhetorical period of composition, which is like, you know, the, what we think of as the Western classical music era and before, where the ideas of rhetoric were what were determining perf- the composition mm-hmm. and the way of making music match elements of, of stylized speech and using rhetoric, which is what all of these composers and writers were talking about, rhetoric for all these years. And then the change happens somewhere in the 19th century, uh, the early 19th century, where we go away from rhetoric. We've got more romantic view, worldview, um, which also meant that we had a change in the way we view composers. We had a, a lot of change. And it also, all of that is happening at the exact same time that we find um, democracy, uh, global democracies taking hold. So we've got it all happening at the beginning of the, you know, the beginning of the 19th century, end of the 18th century. Um, so we have the French Revolution, we've got the American Revolution, we've got all these things. And music is changing with some of those ideals, because some of those ideals are either trickling into music or music is trickling into other things. So I, I, I try to think, well, I'm thinking in a, you know, a rhetorical sort of pre-romantic ideals. So the idea of... Um, the egalitarianism that we would have of the 19th century and later doesn't apply in the same way to the music, just like it doesn't quite apply the same way in politics or government mm-hmm. at that time. So then that changes the way I have to approach the music I'm performing because I'm not worried, I'm not thinking as much about building a, a constant vertical harmony where things are balanced you know like there's constant this idea of constant balance that we talk about and things being well balanced because that wasn't a, that wasn't an aim in right. earlier music that's kind of what i was talking about earlier of the discovering of the music theory over time yeah it, it was yeah. It, like the, as the as the the independently composed lines of music mm-hmm. were being performed then you'd arrive at that moment where a chord happens, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so to speak. And then you, because we're now hearing these chords, um, we have to come up with a name for them. Yeah. And we start to name these things that are occurring because of the other uh, the musical elements that yeah. we're writing. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I think um, as we um, as we teach our students about these types of historical elements, it also ties in very closely to the social elements that yep. I was talking about before and mm-hmm. that we were talking about just now, is that uh, it, it, because even if um, even if we get some aspect of it wrong, and I think this is kind of where I want to drive the conversation now, is because you talked about before um, the difference between, um, I think, the, the or the caution was against the word use of the word authentic yeah, versus um, it historically informed. Yeah. Because I think this is another pillar of why sometimes this music doesn't get performed. 100%. It's, it's a, an intimidation. And I would say um, there is also, it, it, it exists in our modern music too. So for example, if uh, there are a lot of people, um, this, uh, this topic comes up a lot on my show, and I just saw Andre Thomas give a, a presentation. I've seen him give the same presentation three times mm-hmm. now, uh, explaining why white people need to be doing spirituals. Mm-hmm. But, but then it always comes up in the, in the presentation why, why many people aren't. Because yeah. we're afraid to be criticized about doing it wrong. Yeah. And I think that same issue happens in early music. Yeah. Because we've got the, well, what if it doesn't, I didn't know enough about that time period to make it sound. And there's going to be, and then David Simmons Wood's going to be in the audience. And he's going to be like, <laughs> and he's going to yeah. like criticize, right. you know. And, and so I think that's a parallel to the, in the modern times to the, the, what's going on sometimes with how we approach early music. Mm-hmm. And so the way I think of it is with both of those scenarios is the fact that I and my choir might not get it wrong or sorry, might get it wrong is less important than the fact that we really tried Yeah. in the same way that you can't put yourself in another person's shoes literally, but the exercise of trying is still important. And absolutely. And I do think that there was a disservice for a time, I like to think that it's we're coming out of this within the, the field of historical performance practice, where there was this 
air of, um, they, the joke was that um, it was earlier than thou. Um, and, <laughs> you know, that. how I can be more authentic than you, and what I'm doing is right. <laughs> if you don't do it this way, it's wrong. If you're not using the right type of harpsichord, then you shouldn't have the continuo unit. With, anyway, that kind of stuff. And I think that's really ridiculous, because ultimately, we, ult what, what I what I want to do when I and when I talk with students about this is I say there there's so much to learn because there it, it is a very different stylistic thing. It's composed differently. Uh, Renaissance music. It's it's composed differently than we're used to. I mean, even Baroque music is differently composed. You know, it's it's different, and they have elements there. But just start with something, right? So I tell them, you know, choose one thing. And learn as much as you can about that one thing. Maybe that one thing is going to be using just intonation. Like I want to, you know, I really want to focus on this piece, and we're going to do this, you know, this palace piece, you know. And I'm just going to focus on lowering my fifths and you know raising my thirds and making sure I don't have high leading tones, you know, and those types of things, and trying to create that. And that's that's it for this time. I'm not going to worry about mensuration changes, I'm not going to worry about pitch level, I'm not going to worry about ornamentation, because those, if you do that, then yes, it's way, it's super overwhelming, but mm -hmm. we have to start somewhere, and what I want people to say is, you should feel, what I want to say to people is you should feel comfortable saying, here's where I'm starting from, this is what I did, I understand there's more to learn to do, I can learn more about transpositions, you know, in, in, 16th century, you know, music, but I'm just not doing that. So don't, don't look at it that way. And, uh, and, you know, to feel like it's okay to just start and just, just try, uh, and see, see what happens. Um, when I first sang Weep Oh Mine Eyes, the, the, the Bennett piece in high school, we didn't talk about any of those issues, we sang the music, right? Mm -hmm. And we, um, you know, our conductor, you know, our, our choir director led us through, and I think we, you know, we probably sang in sectionals a lot to get mm -hmm. used to ind independent parts, but we just kind of let the music start. And I'm sure we ignored, a, or not ignored, we didn't know. There are a lot of performance practice elements we would not have done. Did I enjoy it? Absolutely. Like, was it, was it a favorite? Was it one of those things that, as a choir, we always said, oh, can we go out into the, you know, into the big atrium and sing it because it echoes so pretty, mm -hmm. you know, and now we know it from memory. We had a good time. So right. I, I, I do think that has been the, the conception that if you're not going to be applying all of these elements of performance practice, that you should touch it. And I did have someone else who mentioned that as I was discussing this article and the issues with this. Someone said, well, you know, if I do a, a new piece that I commission, no one can comment on the performance in, except for like intonation and other things like that, because no one knows it. It's new, right? And oh, so, right. in some ways, okay. yeah. it can be some some ways. Maybe maybe there you don't have to deal with that. Also, it's going to be in modern performance practice that we're already living in. Yeah, and I think it's less about the issue of um, I can just do it however I want. No one can complain because clearly we can. You know, there are lots of ways of critiquing and being critical, but uh, but. You know, it's 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 it feels nice to perform stuff that you that you are comfortable with, and if you're less comfortable, yeah, you're going to be anxious about it. So I just want to say, just start someplace. Yeah. Um, and there are lots of lots of places where the music can meet your groups where they are. So people say, I, you know, I, I don't have the time to teach my my you know my choir uh, a piece where all four parts are totally independent the entire time. There are lots of pieces that are mostly like uh, homorhythmic in here and are kind of on the cusp of being, you know, tonal and you can kind of make, uh, you know, regular analysis work that because there were transitional pieces. So start there, right? Mm -hmm. Do a piece that has everybody singing together and then it ha in the refrain, there's a little bit of polyphony because there are lots of those types of pieces. So start where you're comfortable and there are so many things available that you can always find something. It's written for every single conceivable voicing, um, for ages of voices, for 
any of those types of things. There's, I think there's something available that can fit any ensemble. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that like the, I'm just hearing so many parallels too, with the, the comparison I made before about the uh, approaching cultural music that is not our own, but also music from history <laughs> that is not uh, something that we're super um, familiar with. I agree with you. It, you have to just do your due diligence, do, do, do your due diligence mm -hmm. Everyone know what I meant. Um, and yes, of course, you do your research, you get as much done as you're able to get done, but you also don't beat yourself up over the dissertation you didn't write about Absolutely. about it. You just have to do the music. Yeah. So, for example, if, if you're, because you were talking about your high school experience singing uh, John Bennett, and I think about when my high school kids come into my classroom, their musical historical knowledge and their musical culture is whatever is on their Spotify. Uh -huh. yeah. that, that is their musical culture. So, for example, if I have a kid who, uh, uh, oh, what's, what's your ancestry? Where does your, what you, what's your DNA and me, or 23 and me say, or what, which I would never do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if I did, like, the, oh, yeah, like, we're mostly Brit, like British or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I would say, ah, oh, yes, here is some Thomas Tallis to represent your culture. But my kid has no idea what Thomas right. Tallis is. Right, yeah. He's being exposed to a new culture mm -hmm. when we, because, you know, culture changes over time. Yeah. And, and so when we, that's the value of historical music performance practice to me, yeah. is it's more than just the music. It's uh, like you were talking earlier about thinking about the, the considerations of the time. Mm -hmm. um, we have an opportunity to teach kids about the considerations of the time mm -hmm. while we're teaching the music of the time, which, yes. which, was it, which is its own cultural exploration, so to speak. Yeah. And I think that as when we teach them music and we can start digging into that, what, and really a kind of a an element that I didn't stress as much in this uh, in the article that I wrote but it's something that is really important to me is that I strongly believe that there are elements of musicianship that are strengthened through the performance of this kind of independent polyphony um, modal music and things mm -hmm. like that that we're not getting elsewhere so you know if I, I, everybody has a different way of running their concerts in their classroom, but thinking of it in terms of a well-rounded classroom. So I think a good example of that, which is not Renaissance music, but even earlier is there's a book um, that James Jordan from Westminster Choir College wrote called Discovering Chant. And he wrote this book because he took one of his Westminster groups um, to... Cambridge or Oxford, I can't remember. And as part of the process, they were doing even song. Um, and they were singing a lot of chant while they were there with the other choirs. And he realized that through singing chant, through singing unison, unmetered unison or octaves, they were learning things that they weren't learning other elsewhere, this, like in, in their things. And also this, this concept of entrainment, that ability for a group to know when everybody else is moving on without even having someone directing them, yeah. telling them to do mm -hmm. that. So in train and E-N-T-R-A-I-N-N-E-N-T. -E and so he wrote a whole book about here's how you can use it. Now that doesn't mean he turned around and is putting chant in his concerts. It's an element of, of the warm-up process or it's a, a, you know exercises or whatever that then gives tools that he can use in other music. So, you know, having, having people have a, uh, the ability to, you know, feel a musical line is super important. Mm -hmm. um, Rick Biela, uh, um, uh, great uh, choral conductor, um, talks about sometimes with his, with his groups, as opposed to saying, hey, you know, tenor part, here's where your crescendos and decrescendos are and all this. He kind of lets them all do whatever they want to, and eventually they kind of all come to a consensus, and they find the musicality in their mm. line. Maybe he has high points and low points. Um, and I think that kind of thing come, can, can be experimented with when you perform these independent parts within this kind of polyphony that we're just not having access to with most music that was written in later later periods. Um, and so I just think of it as an issue of we're trying to great, create great musicians. Uh, and this is, it would be, it would be like being a mechanic and saying, I'm never gonna use wrenches. 
Um, you know, it's something. It's a tool that you can use to improve what you're doing. Does it mean every problem is solved with a wrench? No, it doesn't. But do you want a wrench in your toolkit? You should definitely have a wrench in your toolkit. And in my syllabus for my uh, early music ensembles, I say one of the benefits of this is to make you a marketable musician. As if the way I got my first paid uh, paid early music gig was I was a very last minute, like the day before the concert replacement, because I sang with another guy in another thing and he knew that i had the ability to change and, and adapt to style very quickly mm -hmm. and because i had experience with early music and this was an early music group i was able to get the music an hour before our open rehearsal final dress rehearsal uh and make something happen and i think those types of skills are are what we should what we should be teaching and mm -hmm. be, be striving for and i think we can use those those things that we find uh, in early music. And uh, the other part that has, so I teach a course in uh, Music of the World as well, and I also teach the first semester of Music Fundamentals or Music Theory. Um, and one of the things that I have gleaned recently, having, having kind of done a lot of these at the same time this last spring, is um, the construction of the, the way that the music was written through a modal as opposed to like a major minor idea mm -hmm. um, is, is something that we can find parallels in music elsewhere in the world that are in, in living traditions today and elsewhere in the world in the way that like the makamat, the, the modal scales in Arabic music or the, um, uh, um, the uh, the mode the modal scales uh, in Hindustani and Carnatic mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they have a construction of a sort of a two part of a scale construction that's similar to what you would have seen in Europe in this sort of pre common practice period, and we're unfamiliar when I sh when I show students who've never had exposure to that kind of modal music singing and they see it in Arabic and uh, in Indian classical music. It seems different to them, but then I can now show them it's in it's in the DNA of Western classical music. Also, mm -hmm. it's there. It's not like oh they did that and we did this. Like kind of had the same idea for a long time. That's, that's tied into what I was yeah. saying earlier about mm -hmm. the discovering. Yeah, because it's not that I would even push back a little bit against saying that it's tied in like that it's um, uh, that it's a part of European uh, music theoretical. Um, uh, development and it's also part of Hindustani and it's also part of I would disagree with that I would say those things are in nature yeah and people all over the planet we're, right. we're discovering them yeah exactly <laughs> it's there's something there those clearly there is a connection between these ideas mm -hmm. that happened somewhere that you're yeah absolutely and we gave them different names and we did and slightly we different in, things with yes them. and we use them in different contexts right, right. and um, tastes you know and taste change like mm -hmm. The, you know, everybody who's listening who knows about the Picardy Third um, at the, you know, that's used to then go from major and a minor or a major chord at the end of a, of a section or a piece that's been minor. But just to learn, the reason why we did that is because major chords were oftentimes uh, on, on, on tuned instruments in those older temperaments were tuned more purely, the major third, than the minor third. And so they wanted to close the piece with as, as, as clean a sounding chord as possible. And the last chord of the piece was minor. It was slightly out of tune mm -hmm. on a harpsichord or an organ in, in, um, in these temperaments because we can't make it pure. And that's really the reason why it happened. But then it became just the style. Mm -hmm. And then it just started happening. And it wasn't happening because of that. It was just... Oh, we we do this. This is just our convention now. We make it major um, at the end, or you know, we raise it, uh, and you know, little little things like that to know that it was just like at some point people had a practical usage for it, but then it just became the style. That's just yeah. the way we do it. Yeah, and it's even it's true today uh, that our that you could trace all kinds of intellectual ideas about music and music theory that go all the way back through. You know, you can go back a thousand years ago if you want to if you want to connect enough dots. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, uh, at each stage along the way, the technology and also the tastes of the time played a lot of, yeah. a huge role. You know, we're we're in a time now where everything is digitized mm -hmm. uh, and and well tempered 
for the most part, yeah. you know, like in pop music and you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And so, because it's digital and it's uh, well tempered, there's a lot of uh, co copy pasting going on and cutting mm -hmm. and pasting in music that uh, just wouldn't have been possible yeah. three hundred yeah. years ago. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. so the uh, the idea that we are um, that we are using, uh, I guess, a legacy of uh, like we're using a legacy of music theory from four hundred years ago. Again, this goes back to my all my the critique I'm always making about everything. It's just so reductive. It leaves out everything in between. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's that you, you talked about having that well rounded classroom. Yeah. That to yeah. me that's that's what that is. It's it's showing how this connects to this right. and this connects to this and then this connects to you yeah. as that student. And I think to to like the, the point of the article in seeing the fact that there's not a there is a, a very unbalanced sort of rep representation, not just of Renaissance music, but of other periods. And I'm sure if we dig in, you know, there's lots of styles. It's, it's, a, it's a piece of a larger puzzle. And I think the more that we can, that we can expose our students to it, we can use this for, you know, whatever, you know, however it works best within our classroom, what we'll see is we'll begin to see that reflected in those conferences in those other things, be, uh, in those other uh, performance settings, you'll see just a bit more because people are are using it and they're familiar with it, and it will it will kind of work its way out. Whereas if we're ignoring it for whatever reason, whether it's intimidation or um, you know just a, a, a lack of not a lack of knowing what's available those types of things, then, then it's, it's never going to begin to appear. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's not there. If you never, you know, if you never show anybody Van Gogh paintings, then they're never going to emulate Van Gogh. They're never going to see that. They're just not going to see it. And, and it's not going to be a part of their, you know, their exhibit that they put together or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to have a bit more representation, especially considering there's there's lots of room for it. Um, another thing that someone brought up about about it at the, in terms of because since I pointed specifically to the national conferences, they said, well, um, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying I'm trying to show off, and it was it was that idea. If I bring a Palestrina piece to a, a national convention, I'll I'll just be seen to be uninteresting or whatever because I'm programming Palestrina um, when everybody else is programming these other things. I said, and I just, my response to that was, that seems like we have a need for a shift in our our cultural perception of what the Renaissance music was or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if someone says, oh, it's just Palestrina or it's just whatever, that's, that is, that's a writing off of it unnecessarily because um, I think an amazing performance of a piece like that is going to be just as effective as an amazing performance of anything else. Or if you're worried about that, find a, a, a contemporary of Palestrina that's lesser yeah. known, but you, you do sure. a little bit of extra work to find a gem in their catalog. Yeah. I, in, uh, yeah. in, in Contra IKC, back in 2016, we uh, put out a Christmas album, mm -hmm. and I made a concerted effort to get um, about seven or eight tracks on that album from mm -hmm. the early repertoire. And they were all uh, motets that had never been recorded, mm -hmm. um, and by composers most people had never heard of. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that ended up like the um, the Guardian called that one of the best choral albums of the year that year. And, yep. and so it's yeah. it is not true that it has to be boring. No, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't. And you know, this is this is not a, a choral thing, but I had the experience once of being in a in a room where um, a someone was auditioning at a for uh, a professorship at a very respected uh, uh, singer-heavy school. Uh, and he didn't come onto stage and start with the flashiest, biggest operatic piece. He came out and stood still and sang Where Are You Walk? by Handel, which is like a freshman mm -hmm. dinner oh, aria. I, I have nightmares. And... And it's 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 always seen. Oh, it's you know it's a freshman tenor aria, right? That's just what it is. He came out and sang it. It was the, it was the most amazing thing, because because everything was there. 
because he was completely invested in what he was doing. And he made it, you understood why that was a piece of art and why it should be included in the things that we teach people uh -huh. because he was able to do it. And it's, you know, I hear that all the time. People say, oh, you know, the 24 Italian art songs are what's it, 28 or 30 now or whatever <laughs> that we do. Um, and, but there are reasons and there are, there are ways to make those songs come alive, just like there's ways of making whatever Palestrina or anything else come alive. We just have to, we have to invest in it a little bit and we have to, understand that we can we can find that beauty in there and trust um and i shouldn't say that every piece is is going to be as good as another piece I mean, there are some pieces that are going to be more effective but mm -hmm. i think that um that my experience of watching that performance of that that handle that i thought of up to that point is like this just a simplistic thing that you do for a semester and then you really never come back to it unless someone happens to program the as a as a piece uh, and you happen to sing it there um was okay yeah let's let's do that more let's take mm -hmm. these pieces that we think of as kind of run-of-the-mill kind of pieces and let's, let's sing the heck out of them and and uh and i think we can we can really do that and Conferences may not be the best example in terms of, you know, all state choir assessments and stuff because there are lots of lots of things that go into what's cho chosen for an all state choir or a mm -hmm. conference program. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the 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 concert that's going to be in your school's cafetorium can just as easily include a Renaissance piece, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and you're not going to be pushing up against people who by and large, who, who may give you that feed, that negative feedback that you think they might when you're in another place. So let's just start there. Right? right. And then, and then maybe sometime, you know, it'll go, it'll, it'll, it'll become a little bit more regularized, I guess, is the, is the, Ultimate. Yes, and when you're in your cafetorium, nobody, uh, no colleagues are going to judge you. Yeah, uh, exactly. you'll be, it'll just be the parents and the kids, yeah. and the, and they're just going to be like, Hercules, Hercules. They're yeah. going to do their thing, and that's it's yeah. going to be great. And and then those kids will maybe not have done the piece uh, authentically, but they will have learned something about that time, that place, that culture, um, and they might not have known no. anything about it before that. They'll have something. They'll have something to grab onto, um, and that. You know, it might not resonate with all of them, but it may resonate with somebody. And I would, I would just have to say that I have to thank Dr. Ann Howard Jones from uh, Boston University, who was the clinician when in my for my all state choir and whatever that was, 1994, mm -hmm. 95, mm -hmm. who programmed Sicut Cervus for the Kansas All State Choir, which is a big, you know, that's not performance practice to have, mm -hmm. however, right. you know, a few hundred people singing yeah. this motet. That's not, but it I had a it was it was it was a moving piece and I come back to that piece all the time because mm -hmm. I love it. And so, you know, if someone who has the experience that she had, had and and had the understanding was like, I think it's important for this all state choir to sing this piece. You know, yeah. we did that and you know, and we did you know, we we did what we could do with it in our context and it was totally fine. Mm -hmm. Uh so uh you know, just just starting where we can, and at, sometimes I do things with my choirs, and we don't even end up performing them. You know, we we have them on the schedule, and then you know maybe when it comes time to finish the the program, it just doesn't end up working with everything else. But we might sing it for ourselves, right? You know, we might go someplace echoey and and have a good time yeah. to do it. So yeah. Well, David, I think we've covered a ton of ground, yeah. so let's wrap it up here. <laughs> and um, and on, maybe on the way out, mm -hmm. if you wouldn't mind, uh, share with the listeners uh, just maybe kind of your best source of resources mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. kind of thing. If they say, okay, we listen to them talk for an hour. Yeah. We haven't been doing any Renaissance uh, stuff with our kids, but mm -hmm. we're, I'm convinced to try. Mm -hmm. What would be your recommendation for that teacher who, who's in that boat? Um, I think, I mean, there, there are so many... Uh, well, I would refer people, if you're looking for recordings to share with people, you can, in easy places, to go to earlymusicamerica.org because we regularly review recordings. Um, and you can look through, and we almost always have the Spotify playlist for it there. Mm -hmm. So you can mm -hmm. listen to it and just get a flavor for it, and there's a little bit to learn about it. Um, if you're wanting to dive in and, and start to piece apart 
some performance practice things to make yourself feel more comfortable. Um, Dennis Schrock um, has a wonderful book um, and has written mostly kind of from a choral um, part that's performing performing Renaissance music. He has one for Baroque and classical as well. Um, performing Renaissance music, it's really easily digestible and he has like excerpts from some of the treatises after he talks about it so you can see mm -hmm. what it was written about you can point back to it um, i think that's digestible and the other even though it's only a few a few chapters and it's it's been around for a while is the performer's guide to uh renaissance music where there's a chapter by um uh alexander blakely um uh alejandro um, blanchard um that that specifically talk to choral directors mm. and give some really concise tips like hey just you know lift a dots and yeah. just you know do these things if you want to add in a few things to begin it's a starter pack. pack here's your starter pack and the rest of that it's a, that's a thick book that has other stuff in it that's not necessarily um it's you know for instrumentalists and stuff that are specific to to this conversation but i think those are those are wonderful places to start and obviously they have footnotes galore um, mm -hmm. and bibliographies uh, but i think those are some really really um great places to start and i also say that um we're hoping to be uh, planning some combined webinars in the next year or so um, with Early Music America and some of the other core organizations um, toward these types of things. So people should be on the lookout for those. Uh, and the goal is going to be, you know, let's see, let's see how we can do this in uh, in a way that is the least overwhelming, the least pressure. Uh, pressured as possible and um, to give a place for people to really learn uh, how to do it and feel comfortable trying their best. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, and I'll be in touch with you about getting uh, the, all the things that you just listed mm -hmm. and try to put some links in the show notes Absolutely. and stuff yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Well, David, thanks for coming. Yeah, I appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you for sticking around and listening to that conversation. I am passionate about polyphony. I think you should be too. Even if it's not your favorite, time period of music, I do believe that we as educators have the obligation to our students to give them a solid foundation in the art form if we teach a choral music class. This is my opinion, but I believe, as I said with David there, that polyphonic music is a foundational building block of our art form. It's like uh, taking out the, the, the base of a house the foundation of a house and then still calling it a house. We can't take away the foundation in our education and in our performances. So hopefully we've convinced you. And if not, of course, go over to Coral Osfer's Facebook page and let us know that you don't agree. And we can continue the conversation there. Don't forget to use your checkout code Coralosophy. Just enter the word Coralosophy in the checkout box, the coupon box at Graphite Publishing, Endeavor Music Publishing, SightReadingFactory.com, mymusicfolders.com. At the link of the show notes, you can also enter that code to get 10% off of the Voce Vista software. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.